You mean this is the real world? Huh? <laughs> I never thought of that. My mother and I, we had a house in Chicago. Well, we figured, well, we get out of there, you know, while the getting's good. And so then when I got to Vernon, well, I called up these uh, real estate people. They sent me their phone number. So then I seen the picture. Uh, well, the property was $2,200, you know, of course, it was, uh, it, uh, they claim it was too much, but, uh, well, it wasn't too good, it wasn't a castle, you know, but it was a house, you know, and a lot, five lots, so, uh, okay, bought it, had a mortgage for four years, paid off, and so I don't have to pay no rent, see, no taxes, old age, <laughs> No taxes. You gotta like outdoor sports. And I've always loved it, especially turkey hunting. I killed my first turkey when I was 10 years old. I can't tell you how many I killed, but I killed a lot of, a lot of them. I run a business, I close business down for half to go turkey hunting. It's just something that I like, it's just in me. I can't tell you how I feel. It's just a hell of a sport, that's all. Sometimes you'd be standing around I'd, and hear one jar the ground. And you just look at the roads, fire trails, until you pick up fresh tracks and you know which way it's going. You just go to that area. Stop, listen, and hope that you hear one. Sometimes they, they gobble quite often early. Sometimes it's 5, 10, 15 minutes, and later on in the morning, sometimes it's every 30 minutes. You, you just can't tell. They're a smart bird, the smartest we've got in this country. You know, we spend time like this, day in and day out, day in and day out, not hear nothing. But you know they're here. I sent them two checks, one check for $12, a three-year membership, <coughs> and $3 insurance. So I waited, a, a, I don't know, I waited a month or longer, and I didn't get no answer from them. So then I had this lady copy the checks, you know, on a copier. So then I send the copies to them, and now they sent me the jewel, see? I don't know if the jewel is genuine or not. Take a look. I don't know what I'm looking for. 
I don't know, what, it, what does a jeweler look for? <laughs> you know, those guys, it, it, when you go into a jewelry store and if you want something examined, they look it through a lens. And uh, what are they looking for? If you ask them, they, they, they'd go. You ever seen a man's brains? Oh, I've seen them. I take them up, scoop them up, put them in, do, a re do them up like brains. You're buying brains. But there's a bowl right here, and there's a bowl here, a bowl here, and a bowl there. Now, they're connected to the spine. The spine goes down the backbone. And uh, if all four of these uh, bowls of brains, if all four of them is functioning, you can, you're not a one-track mind. You're a four-track mind. And you can, you can, I see a lot of folks, they can type one letter, uh, write me a letter and you a letter on the type machine and writing on one way with this hand and writing your letter with this hand and my letter with that. And I can take pencil and set it down and write catch with this hand and okay, that one. At the same time, two pencils. I've done that lots of times. And these burns, now what, what, I was, what I was telling you was I can't stand up just a, I don't believe without propping against something, it gets me out of balance. I had to get some, get some. And you run one, now, now if you ain't got that, and, and I've offered all over this town, time and again, $20, anybody's doing it. You run that foot in a circle, this way, and then you hand right to the river. Then they just pick up your sister and go and shoot the wreath in your eyes, singing a song. That's four, in other words, there's five things. That's five things I can do on this, on one with this old knot up here. Vernon, third to control. Go ahead. Quincy, can you give me the correct 1036? That's a big ten for him. Appreciate it. We don't have too much traffic coming through now. Sit here and watch them come shooting off the end of that bridge a little bit. That's the only thing I do this time of day. Just sit around and wait. You have to do this in a hurry, because you're going to cover several places at one time. Not at one time, but as quick as you can, because they gobble better earlier part of the morning. And later in the morning, they get the less they gobble. And so you usually, usually kill by all six, seven o'clock at the latest. There's been a lot killed after that. That's the cream of the hunting, from daylight to 6, 7 o'clock.
Then he's looking for a fresh track now. And if he finds a fresh track, he'll stop and listen or go in on it. That's what he's doing, walk, walking and listening right now. Looking for fresh sign that's crossed graded roof. Where there's smoke, there's fire, you know. Find a fresh track, you know he's gobbler there. Because this is a prime area for turkey. Look how that's bogged down there. Bogged an inch deep there in that dirt. He weighs 18, 20 pounds. Look at the size of the track. Look how he's bogging up that hard dirt. He probably caught across that late yesterday afternoon and roosted right back down here in these woods. And if he's got a hen with him, it's very hard to call him away from that hen. You can believe that. Anybody tell you they can call a gobbler away from a pack of hens just any time? Did you hear that? Sounds almost like a turkey goblin, but it's not. It's one of those big woodpeckers pecking. Fool you a lot of times. Occasionally, you'll call a big gobbler away from some hen, but very seldom. I, 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 I'd rather not even try to call one away. Well, you always try, but you can't do it. I've never have. Very, very, very seldom. I have different areas I like to sit around and wait. I sit here a lot of times. Since this car was sitting around so much, while the people, uh, they don't know for sure if we have a police officer on duty here or not. So I can sit here and catch a lot of them as they come across the bridge or come down through town. But like his tanker, he sounds like he's getting on it now. Try to hold him down. I hate to have to get out and chase every one of them down, but I try to let them see me sitting here. So then, if, that, if I have to write them up, why? It's uh, their own fault because they can see me sitting here. I'm not, I'm not trying to hide now, but uh, there is a few places where I sit around where you can hardly see me. And uh, that's why my radar gun, when I have it, I don't have it with me today. I had to send it back in and get it recertified. So I'm waiting for it to get back here. It should be in Friday or Saturday. I can sit out here and catch a bunch of them. They said he was 65 years old. I don't know about that now. That's a long life for a mule. But he eventually died. They rooted him over into that pond. Did old skeleton lie there with a hide all on him, just as tough as anything you ever see. And a big hole in his throat here where the buzzards and things would eat him, eat him a little bit if they could. They couldn't eat them all. And I was a fishing in there one day and dropped my bait down there at that hole, that old mule laying in there, you know, all puffed up. Yeah, dried up on the skeleton. And there's a big warmouth perch run out of him up here and bit my hook. Tuck it in that old mule right that quick, you know. And uh, he got off of there, you know, got loose. And I went to pull the hook out, and I must have hung it on one of his ribs in there. I had to break it off. But I, I put on another hook and uh, dropped down there, and I caught a big one, you know. The bones that had come out of his legs, the skin was laying there, you know, it was tough as a, just tough as a bear, you know. And I got over to about this deep of water and went down in there and got a hold of them legs and dug that old mule out on the hill, and there's 114 warmouth in him, one warmouth perch. 
I could hear him a fluttering just because I run out on the hill with it. The water run out of him, and I could hear him a fluttering in there, you know. <laughs> it was in planted pine, but he had roosted in a branch of the side of planted pine. And I eased in a row of planted pines, you know. Planted pines, they're not exactly in a straight row like that. They'll be, you know, offset. So you got a variation about two foot, maybe, you know. And then getting in planted pines, and I'd walk across the rows, crossways of the rows, till I got right even with where he was at in the swamp. And I knew, I said, right on where he's at. And I'd walk crossways of the rows, you know, till I got that row, till I knew he was right at the end of it. I was working my way in and out. And I slipped up there. I slipped up close enough to the branch I could see the turkey in a pine tree. Tell me he was a goblin. And I got to that pine and I looked, and it was about 30 foot over there to that other pine, and it was about 25, 30 foot more to the turkey. And I looked at that turkey and I looked at that oak spot. I said, there ain't no way I can get no further. And I just ease that gun up real slow behind them pines and ease down. <sighs> Got it all. And there he is, right there. I think he's got about 11 inch beard. He hit the ground. It sounded like a ton of bricks. Now, this here is a gopher. He's not a turtle. He's harmless. He won't bite you. I don't know just how come him to be way down in here. He don't like this kind of land here. He's a uh, high, dry, sandy land for him, and he'll dig his den to be as far as 20 feet deep sometimes. And, uh, He's good to eat, too, but I don't eat him, but people do eat him. He's just a fine piece of meat for the dining table. Uh, I believe he wants to walk now. His motor's slow pace. <laughs> I said, well, y'all just leave my gun here. I got to use the bathroom. I said, you got to come back the same way. They said, yeah. All right. I got my gun. I didn't get to use the bathroom, though. I was fixing to. But right out in the pines, I heard one gobble. And they done, they, they done left. And I said, my God. Boy, that's the best diarrhea medicine in the world. Mm -mm. You hear tur turkey gobbling, you forget all about diarrhea and everything. Headaches, anything. I cure anything. And I'd grab my gun and I'd tow out. I must have went a quarter of a mile, went through a bunch of pines, and he double gobbled. Well, I knew right then that I had a pretty good chance of killing him. Hey, man, it hadn't been 30 minutes since one had been killed. Bless your heart, next time he gobbled, there he was, right out there in them wire grass and broom sage. I just yep real low to him. He gobbled. <clears throat> he was coming right straight toward me. He wasn't walking, he wasn't running. It was sold in a little fast trot. And I had a good blind, some palmettos. I sat behind some palmettos. 
I done had my gun on him, you know. And when he got up there, he was walking a little too fast to shoot him because I wanted a sure shot. And what I done, I just whistled. <whistles> and he stopped and he looked. And when he looked up, that was the end of it. Pow. And that's him right there in the middle with about 11 inch beard. Now, this possum, I didn't catch him myself, but another feller did. He was eating his chickens. And he caught him and brought him down here to me. He said I, I was the only feller that knew what to do with a possum. I'm going to keep him for a fun day in Warsaw and sell him to, sell him to them fellas. Uh, they auctioned them off over there for twelve and fifteen hundred dollars. That's a great price for a possum, don't you know? Uh, I'll put him back. Put him back. You got to be careful with one of them things. They'll bite you. I've been a bit bad. <laughs> I've been bit by everything it is in the country. I was wild game, you know, except a rattlesnake. I always was sure enough watching for him. He just walked. No rain in it. Got looking, and his track was in that track, that trailer track which we just talked to the man five minutes behind us. See, the trailer made a track. We come out the same way he would come in. <clears throat> and you know that's got to be red hot track because it's on top of that trailer track. You understand what I'm talking about? We just talked to back behind us. He's right out here. Stepped outside and yet one time he come right back, gobbling. That gun, we started grabbing guns and getting in position. <coughs> and uh, I told Snake, I said, Snake, I said, that turkey's not coming back across the road. There ain't no way he's coming back across the road. He's going the other way. We'd sit down and we'd yip to him, and he'd gobble. He'd go over this way and he'd gobble. Walk back that way and he'd gobble. He's wanting us to come on. But we wasn't going on. We was expecting him to backtrack. And I told Snake he wouldn't backtrack and come back to us. This went on for about a half an hour. I told Snake, I said, I'm tired of this. I'm gonna kill that turkey. And I yelled one time, and he double gobbled. And that's all I yelled. And the next thing you know, here he comes. Just a, just a goblin all the way. I shot him and he hit the ground. I mean, he was doing a die do bouncing around that three, four foot high. Run down there to pick him up, and he got up. He had a broke wing, and I knocked him down. And I said, my God, he's fixing to get away. And I just tried to shoot his head, bow! And I just shot a big old hole in the ground. I missed his head, because if I'd have shot the whole turkey, I'd have tore him all to pieces. And I missed him, he got out. He's going right down the pine run, and I said, well, one more shot. And I shot him and just rolled him over. And it was cloudy, like I said. And during all this time and around in them pines, everything looks alike. To me, it does. Anybody else that's ever been in there, you can't, excuse me, you can't tell where yet. I got in there, and when I killed the turkey, I didn't know where I was at. You know, I walked around, and I got lost. And I was hollering for snake. I'd walk 
direction I thought it was. I was going in the right direction, but them pines, everything looks alike. And I started hollering, Nate! That's as loud as I could. And they knowed I was turning around and sitting up there just a laughing like the devil at me. And they wouldn't answer me or nothing. But anyway, I drugged that one out the next morning after them two morning before. And there his beard is. About the same length, about 11 inch beard. One on the far right here. Thirty-five, forty years ago, they wasn't a wiggler. They wasn't no wigglers. These wigglers is a is a kind of a new thing in this this country. These wigglers have been in here about twenty something years uh, there. Uh, these wigglers is a new uh, a new thing coming. Yeah, I reckon they was here, but uh, I don't know where they accumulated from. Uh, I got the seed of these from South Florida where I got them. This is not a regular, regular wiggler like everybody's got here. This here is what they call an orchard worm wiggler that I got here. Uh, that's the reason people come here and wants to beat me out of them like they do. I don't know where all this water comes from. You must have a lot of ditches up there. Well, of course, if you've taken the history of the, uh, the Vernon, well, I can't tell you. I can, all I can tell you about the river is somebody told me that boats used to come down here. And I says, that, that river must have been wider, you know, the creek, they call it. But they said no. So, I mean, uh, freight boats, you know, used to come down, just like a uh, freight on the Mississippi River. And, uh, But I don't know. I can't figure it out. Maybe they use big canoes. <laughs> there's a big red wiggler, and there's a wiggler to call the eel worm, and this orchard worm wiggler, and then they got a big ring neck wiggler. Then they got one they call the night crawler. He gets, he, he way like that. I got some of them uh, from up in Joplin, Missouri and brought them down here. They up there. I brought them down here and put them in a bed, a little old bed I had yonder, and they all left. Uh, they crawl at night. You can't keep them in a place. They, they stay around in the edge of the swamp. Out there, there's a lot of muddy water. That reminds me of the story about the two sailors. They were looking at the water, and one says, it's a lot of water out there. And the other guy says, yeah, that's just the top of it. <laughs> hey, those snakes out here, they can swim. Be careful of that. Those snakes can crawl over that water just like they're crawling over the ground. My, I, I, and then uh, some people, they, they says, you're going and swimming? Uh-uh. You're swimming around and then you see, you look up and you see the snake coming toward you. Oh, brother. <laughs> see that jump? You know what kind of fish that was? That could have been a garfish. Uh, usually the garfish, they feed on top, and if there's little minnows on the top, they snap them up, you know. You ever see a garfish? He's got a long, he's got a bill about like that, you know, his nose. And when he, he usually catches what he goes after, you know. I've never studied no book on these wiggers. What I know about them is just self-experience. Uh, they got books on them, but them books is wrong. Uh, they don't teach you right. They don't teach you right on them. Teach you what kind of feed to feed them and how to do them and all that, and it's all wrong in my book. Why he wanted to take his shoe off to pull the trigger, I don't know. 
the very next damn day after we was working. And he said that day, he says, that'll be the last thing I ever do is to shoot myself, which it was. Well, there weren't none of his, wasn't none of his brains are working, period. No, he was, I tell you, he had two shells laid on the sill of the house. He went under there and got them, called under and got them. Come out and told his wife, says, I got one for you and one for me. We're going. She run him down and take one of them away from him. He sat down in an old homemade straight chair. And he take his, pulled his shoe off. And he took that gun barrel right there. And pulled the trigger. And, and pulled his shoe off to use his big coat. Yeah, but what the hell? If I was going to do that, I'd just reach out on my finger. Well, he removed his head from the gun barrel. No, he had to stoop over there. He no. pulled his shoe off and he used in order to use I'd have got me in. I, well, been told everybody to don't do things to life, but he does the way he's done it. Knowing that the Lord had called me to preach, I had to pursue what the Lord placed me here on this world to do. So I started back into the ministry. Sometimes in this line of work, you don't have the finances you'd like to have. You see things you'd like to have. You sometimes wish you were back in a secular position making better money. But then I have a better situation than most people realize. When I have a need, I just pray for it. And uh, just like the van uh, that I have now, I, I felt I had a need for it. And so I began to pray. And then I began to go price vans. But I didn't feel like my prayers and the prices I found on the vans just coincided exactly the way they ought to because they were far out of my reach. But still, I felt like if the Lord wanted me to have a van, I'd get one. So in the process, uh, a couple of weeks after I'd given up the idea of finding one that I could afford, uh, I ran into a man, and he had a van, and I, I was looking at it. And uh, he gave me the price on it. I told him, well, that was out of my range. He said, well, he said, I've, I've got a friend over in Mariana that has a, a brand-new 79 van. It's uh, been on his lot for eight months, and he's priced it down to $5,000 for it can be bought. He said, uh, I know it can be bought for $5,000. I said, well, that's kind of the range I was looking for. And sure enough, I called the man, he brought it to me, and in the process of three hours, I owned the van. God made all things. That was made. All things that was made. And he looked on it and pronounced it good and very good. He made all these things that we've got today. And he said it was good and very good. But you can go to the extreme on anything. You can go to the extreme on anything. And make a hog of yourself. But as long as you let it go like God intended it, you need never worry. He'll give you power and strength and wit to take care of the deal. There was a huge oak right on the bank of the creek, and I went and stood under the oak, and I said, Lord, I don't know if you want me to have this lot or not, but if, if you do, well, then you make it possible for me to have it. So I went along for over a year, and I didn't know if the lot had sold or anything, but over a year later, I had as much money as the man was asking for the lot, and I went to him and to find out if he still had it, and sure enough, he did. He said, but you know, it's really ironic. He said, I've had this thing sold three times. And every time that I've had it sold, something's come up and the party that was going to buy it didn't go through with the deal. He says, I hope yours goes through. I said, there's no question about it. It's going to go through because I know that this is an answer to prayer. Sing the wondrous of
uh, Romans not too awfully long ago, and, and over and over this word therefore, which is the first word in our scripture this morning, began to pop out at me. And uh, I began to think about it because I remembered somewhere back yonder when I was in school that an English teacher taught me something about the meaning of words. And this word therefore had a specific meaning. And I think, well, if Paul is using this word so many times, there must be a reason for it. So immediately I went to Webster's Dictionary and I began to look up what the word therefore was all about. And I found the word to be a conjunction. Now, I had long forgotten what a conjunction was. And so as, as soon as I realized it was a conjunction, I thumbed back through the dictionary to the word conjunction to see what a conjunction was. And Webster's Dictionary said that a conjunction is an indeclinable word that, cannot, uh, that connects two thoughts together. And so I said, well, what does this word indeclinable mean? And so I looked up the word indeclinable and found out that it meant that it was unchangeable. And so I found out that therefore was a conjunction that could not be changed that connected two thoughts together. And so therefore, whenever I found this out, I looked at that word again in the first verse of our scripture and I said, well, certainly, Paul must have said something that this word is connecting together, so let's see what it was. And when I began to look back, I found out that Paul had used that word, therefore, many times in Romans before this and many times in Romans after this. And so I really got interested, so I looked in my concordance, and I found out that Paul used the word, therefore, over 119 times in his writings. And so I think, well, if he used the word therefore over 119 times, I need to find out what the Greek says about it. So I looked up what the Greek meaning was, and the Greek word was on, which had a triple meaning. The first one was accordingly. The next one was likewise then and then therefore. Paul says, therefore, you receive the peace. So if you're here this morning, you're a Christian, and you don't have that peace, I'll tell you what's happened. You have taken back over the controls of your life, and you're holding on to that which you ought to leave in God's hand. As a result, you've lost the peace of your salvation. And you won't gain it back until you have another therefore experience. I thank God this morning for the therefores of Paul here in Romans. Perhaps there's someone here this morning who's never received Christ. They've never let him come into their hearts by faith. They've never said, Lord, I want you to have your way in my heart. You know what God's way in your heart is? God wants to come in and cleanse you from your unrighteousness and make something beautiful out of your life. He wants to forgive you of your sins. And God says, you come on, just believe, and I'll forgive you. The most important thing about turkey hunting is knowing your woods. You can snatch me a snake up and carry us off to a place that we're not familiar with. We don't know the woods, the country. Hey, man, you, you, you're lost. You're lost. It's just like taking me out of Vernon and sending me to New York City. I mean, you, you just can't do nothing with them, knowing the woods, knowing which way they travel. So, in fact, just knowing the woods is one of the... Just knowing the range. And when you go to a new part of the country, hey man, you're lost, or I am. Any turkey hunter's lost. I don't uh, really know of any crimes that's going on here. Just like any town, anywhere you go, you're gonna have little incidents of, uh, you know, things popping up, like someone walking in one of the stores and they might pick up a 
an apple or a, a package of clothespins or bobby pins, razor blades or something like this. But this goes on in all towns. And uh, nothing, nothing really more serious than that. Not, not at this time that I know of. I traveled along the road, you know, with a fella in the car, of course. And I was looking and I said, hey, Barney, you see that water over there? And uh, he says, yeah. So then we come right up to it and there was no water there. That was just a mirage. You see, in other words, that, uh, well, to be uh, uh, scientific about it, the, uh, the lights, you know, the rays or, or the, the light bends, you know, and uh, so I mean, if you get a different reflection, say for instance, now maybe a diamond don't even shine. Maybe it's just the uh, the way it's cut, you know, and and the, the way the light hits it. It's just like uh, some day after the rain, you take a, a picture of those drops on the trees, and you can see them. Uh, uh, it's almost more beautiful than the diamond. I was out here in these woods one night and I just had a feeling that someone was out there and I heard someone had fired a couple of shots out there and uh, it kind of had me worried that someone was out there and I, I didn't know whether my walkie-talkie was working right or not. But uh, one time I was kind of worried or scared, whatever you might want to call it. But this, this will happen to the best of them. Sometimes you just have that feeling that there's someone up close to you or trying to get to you when you're out like that by yourself. I had the camera and I was lucky I, and I held the opera glasses against the lens of the camera and snapped it. Of course, I just about, I almost, I just about judged, you know, where the, uh, I couldn't line it up any other way because it, when you had the opera glass on the lens, you couldn't see nothing, you know, and I held it up and it turned out, now I don't know if this is the moon or not, it looks like uh, some clouds. I don't know if this is a star or what. Well, no, it couldn't be that star because, uh, well, that's a picture of the star. I just pointed, took the camera and pointed it up there. I didn't even sight it and then uh, took the picture that way, you know. Of course, you can see that picture ain't too good. It's a, a cheap camera, you get a cheap picture, you know. Luck, luck, you know. I mean, when something turns out, you say, gee, I'm lucky, <laughs> right? And uh, well, of course, you see, when you have a camera, you have a camera and you point it at a certain, just like if you had a gun, you don't shoot, do you? Well, if you had a gun and you pointed at something, you li you liable to hit what you're pointing at, and then again you might not. See, bullet came in at just about this angle, and went into my seat here. You see, I haven't had that repaired yet. A small hole there. It went in there and lodged in the back of the seat. The, uh, the county sheriff's office came out to investigate and they had to dig it out of the back seat, out of the back part of the seat. It, it came in at an angle from the road. Uh, I still don't know why they did it, probably just to frighten me a little bit, but I'm not one that's gonna frighten easy about things. It don't bug you too much, but the closer you get on him, you wanna make the kill so bad, it's in your blood or you wouldn't be out here hunting. And believe me, it's in mine, and snakes too. And the closer he gets, it's just like you don't be electrocuted. Each day, it comes closer, you get... <laughs> tension, yeah, tension builds up. And uh, tension builds up, it builds up in me. I don't realize it, but it's always a building up. Building up, building up, building up. And the closer it gets, the worse it gets. And after a while, it comes to a point that you forget about it when he gets right there on you. I mean, you go blank. You're concentrating on making the kill. 
And once you make the kill, you shoot, run, get the turkey, or run him down, or miss him. Uh, then all that tense is that's built up in you. I mean, it, it makes it, it makes me sick. You get the dry heave like you got up on the morning after a Saturday night with the dry heaves from a drunk. Gag and puke, just gag, you know. It's, it's nothing but your nerves build up that's dying down. That's all it is. Now, in four or five minutes, I'm all right. Every star you see up there, maybe it is a world. You know, I mean, it was made for some purpose. You know, it's just up there, see? And then maybe uh, in the future, maybe there'll be one Irish world one German world, one Russian world, and, and uh, one uh, colored world, you know, and I mean, each, each party has their own world, you know, and, uh, but who knows, you don't know God's plan, uh, uh, even uh, Jesus Christ didn't know, you know, He's, it says right in the Bible that no man knows that, uh, can find out the answer to that, you know, when the end of the world is. Well, not the end of the world, but uh, the end of our uh, uh, our world. You know, I mean, our uh, our scheme of things. Politicians, you know, or in a little town, when you talk to somebody and you and you tell them about the the lights on the road, they're not blinking. Well, they don't want to take no responsibility. I says, well, who do you call? D O T or? Well, you know, they didn't know. See, they don't care. They should run them out of town on a rail, tar and feathers. Yeah, I like that. That tar and feathers, boy. Wouldn't you like that to see some old, some guy that, uh, or some kid that did something wrong, you know, and they tar and feather him, you know? And well, he'd have something to think about, wouldn't he? The next time we'll give you the hot seat, buddy. I never saw anything more perfect in my life than to see the perfection of God himself. You hear so much, that thing just happened. That just happened. That just happened. Folks think that way all the time. That just happened. You know, fella talking to me in that house up yonder. He said there, was, there ain't no such thing as a God. Well, I said, Mr. D, I said, you believe you're here, don't you? Yeah, I believe I'm here. Well, I said, do you believe any man on earth made you? No, I didn't make me. I said, do you believe any man on the earth made Adam and Eve? He said, no, I don't believe it. Well, I said, what, what made them? How come I'm here? Oh, he said, that just happened. Well, I said, let's call that, you saying just happened, let's call that God, let's give it another name. And say, that just happened, that's what God is, just happened. Whenever I got through work, you know, well, I had a vacation, had a vacation coming, in, coming, in, coming in. in. The Fall boss man gave me a bonus. So I come in home, and we left that evening and went to start out. And we drove all night and all day. We Four, didn't stop. 1,413 miles out there. White Sand Missile Base out there. That's where the first atomic bomb was ever dropped. Sand dunes, you know, there's sand dunes in there. And that sand, it crawls, you know, and it crawls over the roads. And they're sweeping it with a sweeper all the time to keep it from covering up the roads. It's growing sand. That sand grows until the desert they, runs out average 14 feet a year. They got graders they keep the graders off the roads. 14 feet a year. 
graders out there all the time grading that sand off the road. Pushing the sand back, you know, off of the roads where you get in there. Build new roads every day. Wind come, you know, that dry sand. They wraps up so deep with sand overnight. I reckon they run as high as a telephone pole. Paid and went in there, and we got in there where the white sand's at. And uh, we uh, got us some white sand, and I got a jar of him where it, I got it, it grows in it. See, now I had just a little bit of this in this jar whenever I uh, brought it out. And now you see my jar is nearly full. It grows, it grows, it crawls. It crawls up the side of the jar, you see. Yeah, I reckon you're gonna fill up the jar. <laughs> in two more years, it will fill up this jar. They say it grow 14 feet a year out towards the town where Billy the Kid got killed. They say it'll cover that town in a year to come. Uh, this century, they say it lasts a hundred years. It can cover that, that town. town up, that desert, eat it up. Look at that tree. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three. 34, 35, 35th and flu. 35 and one cypress top. Listen to that sound. That. Hear that sound? Get in and out of trees. That flop, flop sound. Mmm, that sound, I sure mistake you for turkeys. Listen. Yeah, yeah, that flop, flop. Limbs breaking. Hear that good flop then? Listen, that gives me the turkey feeling. Mm -hmm. I wish there was many turkeys here or buzzards. <laughs>